On today's podcast, we have Ted Rath. Ted has held multiple prestigious roles in the NFL at the Detroit Lions, Miami Dolphins, and LA Rams. He's currently vice president of player performance for the Philadelphia Eagles. The Eagles went 22 and 1 last season, making the Super Bowl, where they lost on a brutal last second field goal, 38 35 to Patrick Mahomes, Kansas City Chiefs. I've been privileged to see Ted doing what he does best firsthand at the Eagles HQ out in Philly. The intensity, passion, and focus Ted brings on this podcast is exactly what he delivers to the superstars, such as Jalen Hurts, AJ Carter, and Brandon Graham, day in, day out. In this episode, we're going to talk about the power of process, the makeup of elite athletes like Jalen Hurts, and the habits that enable you to win your days. I hope you enjoy. Ted Rath, welcome to the Accelerating Excellence podcast. Great to have you here. James, great to be here, man. Thank you. I'm, uh, I really appreciate your time and really just the opportunity to be on here. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Now, I want to get stuck in with... So the first moment you notice this this thing that you've gone on to excel in American football. When when you look at going back in my career, it started in high school, James, really in middle school, when you start playing the sport and then develop a love for the game and develop an appreciation for what the game can actually teach you. For me, football is a sport where 11 guys on each side of the of the field have to come together. And what is that? That's a microcosm for life. So for me, it's how do you go into a situation learning how to how to get along with people from very diverse backgrounds? How do you not only get along with them, but come together for a common cause and then ultimately try to achieve something great, which is in our world championships, world championships. So developing a love for it at an early age and then just growing in that appreciation is it's only continued to grow as the years have progressed and everything that I've seen through this business and what this career has, has afforded my family and I. And we're very blessed to be in this sport, James. Brilliant. And, and what do you think were the strengths that have enabled you to excel in in what is such a – I mean, it's the biggest sport in U.S. in, in North America, right? Like, what, what strengths have enabled you to excel in the space? Great question. Probably the first thing that I always come to, and this is one of my personal core values, is consistency. If you can consistently put in hard work, if you can consistently show up earlier, if you can consistently – I love this. I'll steal this from Ben Newman, a buddy of mine – talks about the unrequired work. If you can consistently do the unrequired work, the work that no one else is doing, the people, my competitors, the other team's competitors, every other team in our division and the rest of the league, if we're willing to show up consistently day in and day out through the monotonous process and do more than everyone else, then ultimately we're going to have a great team and we're going to have a chance to compete for world championships. And and you've been you've been privileged to work with some incredible organizations um, sort of throughout your career from the sort of high school through to the NFL. Um, was it purely because opportunity presented and you jumped to it or was there anything particular about those organizations that, that, that you, you know, you really liked and you, that made you want to be part of them? Yeah. Another good question. As you go through, obviously luck plays a role and I'm extremely blessed to be in the situation that I'm in, but it hasn't come without hard work, James, you know, this it's, you know, where there's an opportunity, you still have to put in the work. So the day-to-day -day grind has not changed. And there's been times when I first got into the NFL, I worked for free for basically almost six full months without a paycheck. So in the in the meantime of working a full NFL daily schedule, I started strength and conditioning programs for a high school, a local high school. So I'm just working on top of that. I had a long commute at the time. So putting in putting forth effort in situations like that, you have to get the opportunity, which in turn comes with a little bit of luck and being in the right place at the right time, developing great connections. But I've also seen people that have had those same opportunities that have fizzled out and aren't in the league anymore. And those are the people, not that they didn't work as hard. Some of that's bad luck. Some of that's just coming in to a bad situation, getting fired. So as you get into those situations, working hard and then developing a little bit of a reputation. And then as you go, you hope that you, you leave a good impression on the people that you work with, James, the head coaches, the general managers, the presidents, the owners. And then with that typically comes better opportunities. So as I've progressed through my career, I've been very fortunate. Even when I went to LA, it was a great opportunity. But then choosing to leave the LA Rams when we were in the midst of really a Super Bowl run, 
and then choosing to come to the Philadelphia Eagles, it was because it was an um, unbelievable opportunity. And you've been out there, James, when you visited our facility, the ownership is just un unclass. You know, you can't you can't match our ownership with anyone else, Mr. Lori. And then you look at how we run our organization day to day, the leadership that we have in place with our president, Don Smolinski, down to Holly, Howie Roseman, our head coach, Nick Sirianni. We have great leaders in place that allow us all to excel in our organization to compete for those championships. So for me, it's it's come with the opportunity, but it's working and seizing that opportunity and working your butt off, James, literally, once again, consistently day by day by day. But then ultimately, more opportunities typically open up as you do that. Absolutely. And were there ever moments that made you question the career path you were on? Never questioned it. Were there moments that were more difficult? Yeah. I would say I've been fired. You know, I think as you work in this profession, I got fired from the Detroit Lions, and that was something that was difficult. For me personally, it was my hometown team, my high school sweetheart, who's my wife. We had all of our family there. We had started to have children. That was a difficult situation just for life because we were moving away. But for me, as I walked into that, every obstacle can be looked at two ways. You can look at the obstacle and you can look at this daunting mountain in front of you, or you can look at the opportunity within that, James. I looked at it as, okay, I'm going to become mentally tougher through this situation. My family is going to get to have a very unique experience where we're moving across the country. We get to experience a different culture, different part of the country, different everything, different organization. I get to learn from new leaders. I get to see how a different organization does this. And then that inevitably led me to more opportunities. So anytime you look at the obstacle, you're going to have problems because all you're going to see is this huge mountain you have to climb. If you look at the consistent process where I'm going to take one step today, I have to get a job. Where do I want a job? And then within, within a day, I had a multiple job opportunities, choosing the right one, taking that next step. And then once you take and accept that position, showing up and doing the work every single day, you have to do the work. Inevitably, good things will happen if you show up consistently and do the work day by day. Brilliant. And I think, I mean, the, the, the experience you probably had there with the, with the Detroit Lions was all, all too common in elite sport. I mean, it is ruthless, absolutely ruthless. Would you be able to give the listeners some context behind sort of what went on at that period of time at that team? Yeah, crazy, crazy situation. So for me, personally, I was an assistant strength and conditioning coach at the time. I had been there for seven seasons. That was my first NFL team. I had worked in college a couple of years before that. We had went through a roller coaster. When I came into the Detroit Lions, it was the year after they went 0-16. They literally didn't win a game. It was the first team in NFL history to go winless in a 16-game regular season. So we get into the playoffs within three years with a coach named Jim Schwartz. After another couple down years, Jim Schwartz gets fired. We get retained, which is a whole nother crazy story. My daughter at the time was literally six hours old, our first child. And I'm in the hospital. I get a phone call because we had fired Coach Schwartz and we hired a guy named Jim Caldwell. They say, can you come in and interview for your job? I got the hospital wristbands on, James. I'm like, hey, it's going to be a good day or a bad day. Let's go figure out what it's going to be. And I go in, I interview with Coach Caldwell. We get retained, get to stay there, get to get to go back to the hospital, enjoy that process. And then two years go by. We actually get into the playoffs that next year. So we've kind of turned into this perennial competitive team. We're getting into the playoffs for an organization that was not even close the, the prior decade to two decades. We have a down year that second year with Coach Caldwell. Midway through the season, we're actually going to London. We're going to play a game. Before we leave, we fire about three or four of our coaches from the coaching staff. In that shuffle, I get moved to an on-field type position where I'm coaching special teams on top of my day-to-day -day duties. So we go through the rest of that season. We actually turn it around midway, midway and finish out strong. At the end of the year, no one knows what's going to happen. Are they going to fire Coach Caldwell or are they not? We end up firing, <clears throat> excuse me, our president, our general manager. We retain Coach Caldwell, but then in the middle of that, we bring in a new general manager. The general manager sits down and says, you know, I have to make change for the per perception that we're making sweeping changes. And he says, for that, I'm going to let go. The My boss at the time, who's our, who was our director of performance, had been there for 14 or 15 years. They said, we have to make a change here because it looks like we're not making a change if we retain this guy. So they fire him, move on from him. Because I had been there for seven years with him at that time. They said, we're going to make a change with you. Can't hear anything. No one said anything bad about you. We hear you're incredible, blah, blah, blah. They say all the right things. And then they say, we're basically letting you go because we have to make it look away in the media like we are making these changes. So then after that point, had several opportunities, ended up going to the Miami Dolphins. But like you said, to your point, James, it's brutal. It's ruthless. And there's sometimes I know a lot of great coaches that are out of work that are phenomenal at what they do. I also know a lot of coaches that are probably not as good as them that have jobs. 
So that's the world that we live in. It's, there's a ruthless aspect to it. And that's what you unfortunately kind of get used to at some point. I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, you know, at, at these, at, at that stage of your life, perhaps where you've, you just become a father, you may move into the dolphins and then bet- between then and, and now where like, you know, you're in a, a Super Bowl final uh, only a month or two ago, who have been, who are the influential people that helped either shape you the way you work? Man, that that's a never ending question, James. I, I would say this first and foremost, everyone I've ever worked with for around every colleague, every coworker, every employee that I've had, I've learned something from. And I think that's how you have to you have to go into every situation with a growth mindset where I'm going to try to steal information, things that are going to better myself with every interaction that I have. Learning from people like you, and that never ends, James, listening to podcasts like this, having visits, being with people and colleagues and having them come visit. For me, some of the people, I would say one of the best leaders I've ever been around is Sean McVay. I learned leadership from Sean during my time in Los Angeles from a a young guy. Sean's around my age. And watching him as a leader, I learned tremendous value in how you invest in people, how you go into a day-to-day process. I learned several things like that from Jim Schwartz, Jim Caldwell, Adam Gase, every head coach I've ever worked for, Doug Peterson, now Nick Sirianni. Howie Roseman is a guy I've learned so much from the business side of it and how he operates as a general manager. I have the utmost respect from him. And watching a guy like Jeffrey Lurie, James, as a leader, as an owner of a huge franchise, a multi-billion dollar organization, and watching how he treats people the right way, how he knows everyone's name, how he's invested, how he does the small things, how we have Christmas events, how we have family events. Those things don't go unlooked. And I, I think as you watch that, I've learned more from the life perspective that is hopefully helping me be a better Christian, a better father, a better person from all those people and not just the X's and O's and how to go in and be a successful football team. It goes beyond that. And I think that's something you can't put a price on because that's invaluable for my family. Absolutely. So obviously I'm over in London and the NFL is growing fast in popularity in the UK and Europe. Um, but one of the exposures we have to it is sort of the movie version, you know, whether it's any given Sunday ballers, mm-hmm. you know, w- what would you say most, uh, most people, even in the States, perhaps that behind the scenes and not working at the teeth end of it, perhaps misunderstand about how it's perhaps portrayed in the media as a sport. That's another great question. How the media portrays it sometimes, you know, people are sometimes almost more shocked to hear this. There are a lot of parallels in, in some of the portrayals. <laughs> Some good, some bad. Now, I would say this, too. What it doesn't show is the the behind-the-scenes grind, the nitty-gritty work. I mean, when you look at the hours that the personnel staff, the coaching staff, the front office, the performance staff, the medical staff, when you look at what goes on to make it function and to just get to Sunday with a healthy team that's suited and ready to go, there are hundreds of people working behind the scenes and we're working 16 to 18-hour days for basically half the year straight, then you might get a week off, then you start back up for the off season to the draft. It's a grind. And I think you you don't have an appreciation for that until you live in that world of what goes into it day by day, because it is a lot of work. It's a lot of stuff just to get you to Sunday. When we do go to London, James, when those games happen, that planning starts months in advance. I mean, that planning just to ship over product, Gatorade product, food product, some of the things from your executive chef and your performance staff, those things take place five, six months in advance. And when we get the schedule, we start that methodical planning process. There's things like that going on at all times. And then obviously the draft and talent selection, that never ends. We're looking at next year's draft group. We're looking ahead and we're trying to build for the future so that we can sustain success and have that excellence literally not just today. Don't be a one hit wonder, but multiply that and keep repetitively going after that every single day. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in your role now, you've got these, it's, it's a, we've talked about how it's a ruthless industry. The, 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 you know, I've seen how the work that goes into it, it's sickening. It's a sickening work rate required to excel in, in any part of that setup. But what is your favorite thing about your current role? I, it, this is part of what okay. makes me sick. Yeah, it's You're the grind. Sick, man. Because I wake up, number one, I don't. Yeah, I I love going to work. I've never worked a day in my life, James. So for me, that grind, there's something about it knowing that I can wake up earlier, I can get more accomplished by 7 a.m. than most people will by the end of their workday if they work a normal nine to five. 
I have a desire to outwork everybody else that's trying to come and take my job. I have a, I love that part of it. So for me, I think that's when you get congruence, right? You love what you do and you're willing to invest in it, but also there's a balance there. And that's the hard part is trying to find that life family balance while we're still doing this. And thankfully that's why being able to bring kids in and having a family friendly atmosphere helps that because the grind, it is unhealthy. You got to be a sick person, James, to excel in it. You do indeed. Um, in terms of, we, we touched on briefly about the, about the London thing and the London events, and, and London turn goes NFL crazy when the teams are in town. But I wanted to ask you, sort of, you know, you'll know more than anyone, but I've always wondered, how do the players really feel? Because it's, it's a, I know you travel across time zones in the States, but it's a hell of a trip. Mm-hmm. It, it's, a, it's a hell of a it, ton of effort in terms of the prep you've just described how do people sort of really feel about it are they excited or is it kind of annoying or mixed another good question i've done the london game four times and with multiple organizations one of those organizations i was with la and we look at that time zone when we're coming from the west coast in the u.s all the way over there that's a significant change so for us it's not just that game Number one, guys get excited because you're looking at, for me, the first time I went, and I still get excited. I love London. It's a great town. For me, every time you get an opportunity to go to an unbelievably historic city like London, that's an opportunity to develop yourself and to see things in the world that otherwise you might not get the opportunity to. I think most people feel that way. But it also, when you're traveling from Los Angeles, for example, that changes the entire week prior to that. So we're going to an East Coast game. We've done it a couple of different ways. One was in Jacksonville, for instance. We play a game in Jacksonville, Florida. We end up staying in Florida for the full following week. And then we fly straight to London. We practice there, do our preparation for two to three days. And then we play the game. Then we stay overnight. So when you look at that, it's about a 10 to an 11 day jog where we're away from family. So it's more the stresses of that where it's definitely different. It throws your weekly routine for a, for a very big switch. And in the NFL, the consistent routine is what we have the advantage of. It's not like some of the other sports where they play on a Tuesday night and a Thursday night, they try to fit a squeeze in a squeeze in a practice like an NBA team. So for us, that consistency gets thrown for a big loop when you do have that international travel. But all in all, it's an unbelievable experience. It's an experience guys will never forget. The fans are awesome over there, James, as you know, and the excitement is continuing to grow. You can feel and then expanding to Germany and some of these other places. I think it's only great for the league because it gives players, coaches, staffs, an experience of a lifetime. Hopefully it's drawing in fans and giving you guys something in return. And that's what we're passionate about. I think that's why you see guys amped. They get amped up for that London game because they know we're putting on a show for a unique fan base. The energy, the excitement is so unique. It's almost like a Super Bowl level there. So when you look at it, it's a very unique experience that everyone for the most part enjoys. Oh, it's great to hear. And uh, you know, from my perspective, I'm just loving it. And I hope, hope long may it continue. I wanted to ask you about you're you you talk you're you're at Philly now. You got some incredible players in the team, let alone the the setup behind the scenes uh, organizationally. But who would you say are the main cultural architects in that team at the moment? Ooh, easy, easy question. That's Jalen Hurts. Our quarterback, James, is a unique, unique individual. He's 24 years old. And when you look at what he is from a level of maturity, He acts like he's been a 30-year head coach. He has an understanding for how to draw out culture, how how to really bleed into his teammates, how to invest in them. He's so strategic, James, just how he goes about interacting with individuals on a one-on-one basis. And then there's times where he'll bring over an entire position group, take them out to dinner, take them out to a basketball game. He gets that aspect of it. And then on top of that, he's one of our hardest workers. He shows up early. He stays late every single day. The players, the locker room, the building, the staff, everyone sees that. And when you have one of your star players and really one of the star players in the entire league and the entire world, and he's your hardest worker, it's really easy for everyone else just to follow the lead. And then we also have guys, we have a unique blend of veterans. We have Jason Kelsey, Lane Johnson, Fletcher Cox, Brandon Graham. We have some of the best guys. I can name our entire roster because what we have that makes it special, James, is our best players are our hardest workers. Once you have that combination, everything else takes care of itself because you just show up and do the work. That's beautiful to hear. And and I guess the other side of that is selection and bringing in the, the hot prospects I mean, could you could you share with us how how or the any the approach you take to selection, uh, uh, Philly? 
Yeah, it, it's character, just like what we just talked about. When you can find congruence between someone who loves the sport of football, but they're also willing to put in the work, they love the grind, they love that aspect of it, you you check them off and you say, all right, this is probably a guy that's going to be a Philadelphia Eagle. We have a long, complex system where we look at what does it take to be an Eagle, but to sum it up, you have to love football, you have to be a good person, and you got to be willing to work for it because for us, accountability – and looking at yourself critically in the mirror is something that's hugely important and valuable for a player, for a coach, not just when we draft players, when we bring staff members into the building. When I go through an evaluation process of someone we may hire or someone we may bring in, even if it's at an internship level, do they fit within the culture and the context of what we're trying to do? You have to fit that mold of what a Philadelphia Eagle is for you to be become into the building and then be able to be successful. So for us, character but also love of the sport love of the game and love of the work that goes into the game and, and what role is data playing in selection for you significant i mean a huge role we have an unbelievable data analytics department and everything gets looked at james as you can i mean every sport's doing it now for the most part some people are doing it at a higher level but the amount of information that we're pulling in just from that, just from the performance metrics that we get. And then on top of that, when we go into the player metrics, when we go into the actual on field stuff, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of rows of data that we're piling through with each individual athlete. And then when you look at how many guys we're assessing, it's hundreds and hundreds of athletes. And on top of that, we still do it for the rest of the league because we're in free agency and we're still trying to improve the roster from within that concept. So for us, it's two-sided. You have to look at the data from the college, the incoming players, but also the returning players who are potentially going to become free agents at some point who we might get onto our roster. And who are the who are some of the hot prospects or younger guys in the in, in, that have come into the the, the team and the organization that are showing those things? You talked about what it takes to be an eagle. Mm -hmm. Are there any in particular that stand out? I'm sure there's a few. I'd Definitely. Once again, Jalen Hurts, but I mean, he's, everyone knows that. I would say guys that are up and coming, a guy like N'Kobe Dean, who's a Georgia guy. You look at Jordan Davis, they were two of the guys we got last year. We kind of went all Georgia defense. And then this Still year, right, we're yeah. going to follow up. So when you look at the guys, Devontae Smith's another one that comes to mind, Landon Dickerson. So you look at Alabama, Georgia, and what is that? Well, there's not a coincidence when you draft players that have won multiple national championships and competed for others. They've been in winning cultures. Typically, those are the players that are your hardest workers. Those are the players that love the sport. And those are the ones that are willing to invest the time and the effort to get to that championship level. So when you look at it, there's a lot of guys. Our draft class over the last several years have been phenomenal. That's It's Howie Roseman and his credit to him, but the whole staff diving into the important things like we're talking about, James. It's not just, it's not just the data. We could go in and find good players. Do they fit within the culture? Is their character right? Will they blend in with our locker room? And they're going to help the Philadelphia Eagles become 1% better. Yeah. So in terms of talent, have there been any that you've come close to sort of snapping up that have perhaps slipped through the net and you've gone on to excel at other organizations? Yeah, you can. I mean, that happens every year because you're only allotted a certain number of picks. I think some of the guys look at Tom Brady, one of the greatest ever, the greatest ever at the quarterback position. He was a sixth round draft pick, James. So you let 200 athletes got chosen before him. What did someone miss? But at the same time, you have to give credit to Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots because they saw something in them. They took them. They made that that choice. So for me, every year you're going to have guys on the upside and the downside. You're going to have some guys that maybe were top 10 projections. They got picked in the top 10 and they fizzled out. You'll have other guys that might have been third round projections. They get drafted even later in the fourth, fifth round, and they become all pros, first ballot Hall of Famers. So I think every year you're going to have that. That's why it's not 100 percent. If it was that easy, James, everyone would be really good at making draft selections. That's one of the most complex and most difficult aspects of the sport. 100%. And the, and the Brady one's just a fascinating story. And I've always wondered as someone who's semi-obsessed with talent identification, was it, did, did people actually miss anything or did the Patriots activate something that was bubbling, but hadn't quite manifested yet? And it, it's a fascinating one. I guess ultimately we'll never know the, the truth, but uh, no doubt. What, what a story. I wanted to, I wanted to bring, uh, I guess, the conversation towards like, what makes most of us fall in love with the the idea of elite performance and that's almost like these what i describe as like peak experiences and i wondered you know from your career so far is there a, a specific moment or period of time that stands out as like 
that was just just incredible moment for you where you've enabled you've been able to access all the technical ability you've had the organizations had to just deliver on demand under pressure yeah i love it because as you're asking this i'm kind of going through a snapshot of the last 15 years i'm like man when is when do when do i feel like i'm in the flow basically and for me it's happened a few times some of the ones that are more pertinent when Sean McVay and I took over the LA Rams, Sean was the youngest head coach in the history of the NFL. I was the youngest in my role. And when you take that on, the first thing we do is go through our offseason training program, which is heavily dependent on strength and conditioning and performance and everything we do on that aspect. So we had to really lay out the culture in 2017, our first year there. So when we onboarded the culture and when we started preaching, when we hit the ground running, James, Sean and I were in congruence because we were reading the same book at the time. We were we were both on the same page, how we kind of came up with some of the cultural values. And then when we laid it out, watching Sean lead and then just picking up the ball and taking off where he left, I felt like we were in such a flow. It was probably one of the best off seasons I've ever been a part of. And then another time that comes to mind is last off season to really, I'll say in a, in a moment, we're repeating it right now. But last off season, I felt like the competitive stuff that we brought into our team really transformed and helped our team connect. We we went to, you were out there, James, you've visited before, you've seen how we do it. We had a team training session. And a lot of this comes because of post COVID where we couldn't have the team together. We were limited. We could have 15 players in one room at a time. So for me, it became, let's get the team back together so we can connect, we can compete together and start to grow together because there's a psychology to that. So for me, we started to build and start to bring everyone together. And then we put them in highly stressful, highly competitive environments And we watched them compete and then we fed into that energy and we drew out of it. So for me, that happened last year. And obviously it it led to a Super Bowl run, but trying to transcend and do that year after year after year, that's what we're going through right now. We just wrapped up our off season and we, we literally repeated, we got back into competitive environments. We put them into situations that was stressful. They had to respond. They had to rely on each other and they had to compete against each other. And then they had to hold each other accountable. So ultimately everything that we're trying to do is transcending into putting them into stressful environments so that when they get in the middle of a fourth quarter and it's a game to get into the playoffs or to get into the Super Bowl and it comes down to one play, They've already been stressed. Psychologically, we've already taken them as close as we can to that exact moment. They shut their mind off. They go to work and they just do what they do at that point. Yeah, I mean, and I, I I can certainly vouch for the the intensity that I experienced when I was over there. It's uh, it's impressive and inspiring. Sorry to interrupt the podcast, but before we dive deeper into the conversation, I want to express how grateful I am that you're voluntarily choosing to spend your time here with us. I also want to take a moment to ask for your support. I want to bring you the best podcast I can in terms of guests, engaging discussions, and thought-provoking conversations every week. And that's where you come in. By hitting that like button and subscribing to the podcast, you play a vital role. Simply put, when you hit that like button or subscribe, you enable the podcast to reach a much wider audience. And the wider the audience, the easier it is for guests within my network to convince their agents, management teams to free up their diary and come on the show. Thank you in advance for your likes and subscriptions. Now let's get back to business. Then I guess there's the other side of peak performance, which is that we've all inevitably had that time where we metaphorically get kicked in the nuts. Uh, everything's going to plan, then whack. Uh, is there a moment that stands out out for you there? Couple, same thing. Uh, our first year, as I mentioned, Detroit, we had come in and the year prior, they were the first NFL team ever to go 0-16. We won two games that first year that we were there. And James, when you go two and 14 and you're obsessed like I am with just making sure that the process is right so that you can ultimately enjoy the results of winning, that was a tough year and it just felt like it was repetitive. So once again, you start questioning yourself, all right, what am I doing right? Do I need to do anything differently? What am I screwing up here? How can I get better? And trying to take that self-reflective, self-accountable mole and looking at yourself critically every night that was a hard time and then same thing even when you get to the point where you're highly competitive i remember in la there was one year 2018 we went to the super bowl this year we lost two games in a row for the first time since we had been there so it's been a year and a half two years it's our second year we hadn't lost two games in a row we finally did for us that was small adversity So we looked at it and we're like, all right, how do we respond? You don't let an opponent beat you twice, so you have to move on. Put it to bed, focus forward, make sure you're learning from your mistakes, but then you have to pour every bit of energy into getting better and making sure that that doesn't happen again. Incredible. 
And 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 in that moment when you're you, you know it, the, the game's over, you've 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 lost those two games on the bounce. What are the emotions in in terms of the team? Is it is it anger, frustration? Is it sadness? Is it a combination of those things? Like you know this, James. Every psychologically, how different is everyone built? So when you look at a locker room full of sixty players and then another twenty five coaches, then a front, you got a lot of men standing there and women, and you look at them and you say, "All right, where are we?" Everyone's in a different place. Some are angry. Some are just numb. Some are literally going through the physical trauma and figuring out where they are just from the competitive battle they just went through. So I think when you look at it, there's no one size fits all. That's why getting in, getting in and really trying to dive in and understand what goes behind people's motivation, each of your players, what drives them, what's their why, because that changes. It changes week by week. It changes year by year. There's a guy who's on a second contract who has different motivating factors than a guy trying to earn that second contract and get a big payday. So you look at what motivates them and what they're upset about based on a loss, or maybe they had a bad individual game. You have to dive into each one of those. So context is ultimately the most important thing you can look at, whether you're coming off a loss or coming off a win, how to motivate those guys or those people, whoever you're working with coming out of that to get better into the next competition. Absolutely. And then obviously, like you know, last season, we've touched it very briefly, but you, you make the Super Bowl and it's an incredible game, but unfortunately the result doesn't quite go your way. How, how do you bounce back from that? How do you emerge stronger from from that, I guess, ultimately you failed to achieve that objective at the, at the at the final hurdle. Yeah, the first step in in getting past that is making sure that you're not making excuses. And one of the coolest things that I saw, James Bradbury, who was involved in, in the infamous uh, holding call, and first thing he got up on the podium, this is 30 minutes after the game, after effectively we lost the Super Bowl based on a big part of this play. And he got up there, he said, no, I held him. Didn't make an excuse, didn't say it was a tic tac he call, didn't say anything that the fans, the media, or anyone else might have been saying. He just looked at himself critically, said, I screwed up. Here's how we're going to get better. I'm not going to live in the past. I'm not going to make excuses. And if you would have seen how he's been dialed in this offseason, James, the psycho the psychological effect of that, he's handled it the right way. So it's not how you go through it, it's how you get forward. So for me, it's always we don't we don't lose, we're learning. So we either learn or we win, and we're gonna find a way to really win next time. So don't live in the past. Rip off that freaking rear view mirror that still shows the Super Bowl. We're not focused on that. We're not a Super Bowl team because that was 2022. We're the 2023 Philadelphia Eagles, and we have to focus on everything that we can possibly control today to get better so that tomorrow we can repeat that process and do it once again. Amazing. Uh, and, and you're coming into your off season and by God, you've got to make, make use of it because you don't get long. How, how do you switch off? How do you, I mean, the other side of training competition is rest recovery. I mean, how do you do that as, as an organization? And then maybe I'll touch on you personally. Yeah. As an organization, right when the season ends, obviously you go into what just happened and you kind of sit down, you try to decompress. For us as a staff, we really switch forward to draft combine prep and everything else. Players, thankfully, got a little bit of time off. So what we recommend, hey, guys, take the next couple of weeks, go away, stay active, take care of any surgeries that we have to get, anything else we have to do physically, but stay active. Don't do anything that's going to degrade your joints. Make sure you're, you're going through the recovery process because it was a seven month grind when you look at what their bodies went through week after week after week. So physically, we try to get the rest of the recovery there. As a staff, it's hard to do because we did get thrust right back into it. And then fortunately, right now, it's our summer months. It's June. So for us, we get time off now. And that helps because mentally, psychologically, the grind of that 11-month period, it's significant, you know, it, and it does. It wears on you. You get tired. You get fatigued. We're all humans. Even if you love what you're doing, you're still going to hit a level of fatigue. So for me personally, it's going away. It's taking trips. I always try to take a trip, just my wife and I, every summer. And then we'll take several little mini family trips just to get back with the kids and make sure every day that we have, we're trying to maximize. When I do get a chance, taking the kids to school, picking them up, that's restful to me, James. That kind of gets me back into the right mindset of what am I, why am I grinding for 16 to 17 hours a day? Oh yeah, it's for these guys to make sure they have a better life and they can see dad putting forth the effort and achieving something great because ultimately, hopefully that's going to help them become great at whatever they choose to do one day. So the rest is never enough, James, because once you get back into it, you just flip the switch and you're in work mode. But for me, it's critically important for two aspects, the physical side of it, absolutely. But it's that mental side and making sure that your family is is getting all the benefit of you being home at that time. 
Absolutely. Um, and I imagine there's some uh, political ap- capital you have to uh, earn with your partner after a, a tough seven month season. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt about that. And and then inevitably the season kicks off again. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things I sort of talk about is this concept of, you know, excellence is really a series of days. And if you win each day, you know, across time, excellence, results, success, outcomes should take care of themselves. In terms of win in your days are there anything any routines that you have in terms of morning evening transitioning from work sleep that that uh you know ted rath just does not miss yeah i love what you said there too and i i couldn't agree more i always say one of my favorite quotes is do your habits of today align with your goals of tomorrow so for me it's all about those daily habits it is the daily process my first thing when i wake up don't ever hit snooze. Make sure you're getting up on the first, bam. I try to flip over. It probably scares my wife most mornings, but I try to get out of bed as fast as possible. And when I do, James, I hit the ground. I get on my knees. I thank God. I say prayers. Then I get up and go to work. I'll read. I'll read scripture. And then I'll read something that's personal development, research-based, something that's helping me. And then when I go to work, the first thing I do is work out. I have to get in physically. For me, it's going through that process, physically putting the work in to make sure that I'm maintaining my health but also to make sure that I know, hey, I'm physically ready to perform my duties at the maximum ability that I possibly can. And then when I'm done, I'll do some form of cardio. And then once again, I'll read. So as I'm doing the cardio, I'm reading. So by the time an hour and a half, two hours have went by, James, and it's still the sun's not even close to coming up. I've already listened to a podcast. I've read, I've read scripture. I've said prayers. I've worked out physically, mentally, emotionally. I've taken care of myself so that now I can get thrust into the thousand fires that are about to pop up and all the people that need my help so that I can be mentally ready and focused to prepare to help them each and every day take those same steps. And then it's all about their process and their habits. Fantastic. Um, And what out of interest, what sort of training do you enjoy? And uh, you talked about obviously your strength side of things and cardio, but I mean, is there anything specific you do protocols you follow certain times of the year? I'll actually do what our players do. So for me, I'll actually go through a a macro cycle if it's the offseason. I'll go through some of our offseason training so that, number one, physically, I can feel what the players are feeling. That's going to give me a better appreciation when they do give me subjective feedback or some of the wellness questionnaire information that we might get. I'm like, yeah, I feel that, too. All right, lower body emphasize. Yep, glutes are definitely sore. Here's where we are. So from a physiological standpoint, that puts me in tune to help them better. But also at certain times of the year, I'll just go through pure strength if I feel like I need to lift heavy. So I kind of go subjectively off of me, James, but there are certain times that I definitely want to feel what our players are feeling to get me into the mode where I can hopefully help them and appreciate how they feel physically a little bit better at that point. Amazing. And then how important is sleep to you? Critically, man. This is something, and there's so many, there's great wearables. There's Aura Ring. Eight Sleep is something that's come out that we've leveraged and utilized, and it's it's worked awesome. It is one of the most underappreciated aspects of the entire business, of the entire world. For me specifically, last year, one of the things that I, I really feel had a huge impact, we moved our schedule a little bit to allow more sleep, not just for players, but also for our staff, and we saw dividends. It, was not, it wasn't only evident just in the on-field markers, which obviously we performed well last year, but when you looked at psycho- psychologically how our coaches looked, how they felt. When Once you get into the season, a few months, everyone kind of looks like a zombie at some point, James. You're like, man, that guy hasn't. He slept at the office last night. This guy looks like crap guys looked better. So then subjectively talking to staff members and players, asking them, how do you feel? Man, I feel a lot better at this point in the year than I normally would. We saw the dividends and we felt them. And then we we lived through it physically. Obviously it paid for itself, but also mentally and emotionally, those things help. And they add years to your life. Like we all know, James, I think you cannot stress the importance of sleep enough. So we're coming in to the 2023 season. What are you most excited about for that? It's the opportunity to demonstrate that you can return to the same point that we were. We can't get to the Super Bowl today. We can't get to the Super Bowl tomorrow, James. You know this. But if we can demonstrate the resilience, the mental toughness, and really the aggressive hard work that it takes to get better every single day and fast forward at the end of the year, if we're where we want to be, that's what I'm most excited about. It's the day-to-day grind. Can we continue to show up? We just did it with our off season and we showed up every day. The guys put in the work, they put in the effort and we, we achieved a lot of great things through the off season. 
Next up is training camp. Can we get better day one of training camp? I'm excited for that grind again, because if you can do it, you can demonstrate you're mentally tough and you can demonstrate that you can go achieve great things. And what are the most innovative things you're seeing at the moment in terms of the human performance side of things that are being tangibly applied in the uni? I know you've talked a little bit about the sleep and some of the tools there, but is there anything else that comes to mind for you? Yeah, sleep's the big one, but also, I mean, you look at where we are from force plate data interpretation, we're light years ahead of where we were even five years ago, James. You look at the on-field yeah. metrics, uh, utilizing devices like the 1080. I mean, there, there's so many good devices and technology pieces that can help us make actionable decisions. So measuring neuromuscular fatigue is hugely important, obviously, for us. Some of the biomarker testing that's coming out now, not just blood, but in saliva. There's so many things coming out down the line that are going to help us, help our players. It's amazing to think about, and, and it's inevitably going to lead to healthier athletes, longer careers, better entertainment for the, for the viewers, for the fans, and ultimately a better, safer football game. So for me, it's all a win, and the more technology we get, that we can bring in to help us do that, the better. Amazing. And, and I'm assuming all the, all the data from that you're just using as leading indicators to help you optimize that load management piece. Yep. And I always say this, your coach's eyes, the best piece of, of technology that we all have, because if the data is telling me one thing and I am completely off base with where I thought our team was, then my coach's eye is probably not very good. So nine, nine times plus out of 10, we're looking at the data, we're interpreting it, and I'm saying, all right, here's what I think it's going to show me. Yeah, ding, ding, ding. This position group's neuromuscular fatigue flagged. Hey, they flag for muscle soreness. They flag for this. Typically, it's going to be in alignment with what you think is going to happen. The technology is just one more marker, and it gives you that added complexity of more confidence to where I can go and say, hey, coach, we need to change practice. We need to make a couple of adjustments. Here's why. Here's where we are. Really interesting. And obviously, I think in, in the popular media, there's been a lot lately about um, cold and the benefits of cold treatment. But there's also been some, you know, I've heard people debate, you know, shouldn't use cold after training. Other people swear by it. What, what's your opinion yeah, I think it matters on the time of year. So first and foremost, we try to limit anything where we're going to purposely knock down the body's inflammatory process in the off season because we want their bodies going through that inflammatory response. By the time we hit training camp, now we're starting to sprinkle in some of those recovery modalities like cold tub or hot cold contrast or some of the other things. So it's athlete dependent, James. And what we're finding, once again, from biomarker testing and some of the data and some of the research out there, we're finding it's individually based, but it's also specifically metric based. So for me, if, you're, if your biomarkers might flag for muscle damage, there's a different protocol that you should take place in rather than athlete B, who's just neuromuscular fatigue status is down 17, 18%, two completely different athletes, two completely different situations, how we'll attack both of those. So there's no one size fits all answer. I would say me personally, I've utilized cold at certain times of the year. I don't utilize it at others. For some of our athletes, that's what we recommend, and that's kind of what we build into their protocols as well. But overall, it's not just, hey, team, do this. It's look at this individual, look at the context of what's going on within them physiologically and sometimes emotionally, and let's let's dive in and let's attack specifically with what that athlete needs. Yeah, that, make, that makes total sense. I mean, a, a, another aspect or area within physical preparation that gets a lot of uh, a lot of conversation is supplements. Mm -hmm. um, I guess you know what what might your advice be to someone listening to this who's probably quite a type perhaps they're in the military working in finance or they're just ambitious getting after it and they want the basic you know build a bit of muscle cut body fat what, what's your advice in terms of supplements and that there's a lot of good ones out there james and you know this I, the first thing i always say is make sure you're being safe and smart get products we use nsf certification it's what the nfl and the nfl pa you know, recognized basically as the safe supplement. So anything that's certified NSF, you feel relatively good that it's a safe product. You look at the ones specifically that have been studied, the most creatine is probably the most studied supplement out there. <laughs> you know, I, I absolutely think you can, you can supplement with creatine safely with the recommended dosage and you'll have great benefits from that. I think you look at the fish oil, some of the benefits from fish oil, they're even finding things just from the day-to-day -day people out there experiencing migraines Fish oil supplementation can help knock that down and knock down the risk of, of daily migraines. You look at just a multivitamin, the benefits of vitamin D. There's so many things out there right now, James, but I think most importantly, I would say 
be safe, be smart, do your research. And then dependent on your activity level, what do you need? What are your needs? Are you trying to build muscle mass? Well, then creatine and proper protein ingestion is going to be highly important to you for that specific circumstance. And then in terms of training protocols to people that are perhaps, you know, that they don't have the luxury um, of being a professional athlete. So maybe they got that 45 minutes at lunch, Mm -hmm. 45 minutes later to an hour after work. What what are the what do you think are the non-negotiables? What are like the first principles you want to be getting right if your if your aim is to just again get strong, build a bit of mass, uh, and ideally cut some body fat? Yeah, forty five minutes is a long time. You can get a lot accomplished in forty five minutes, especially if you have five training days. So when you look at it, James, prioritize. If your goal is if your goal is strength first, you just want to get stronger. Well, then you have to prioritize training with appropriate loads you're going to have to go you're going to have to train heavy at some point you're going to have to continue to push the strength boundaries if your goal is just to become more fit more athletic lose weight whatever it is then you have to balance those objectives you still need to strength train you still need to build a certain level of muscle mass male and female but then you're going to have to sprinkle in anaerobic anaerobic work so for you it's setting your priorities and then finding the time to do it and then the hardest slash easiest part of it simple not easy james is actually freaking doing the work Show up. If you have 45 minutes, don't spend the first 10 talking to friends or or BSing by the water cooler. Get your butt down to the weight room or wherever you're going to exercise. Get out there. Go for a run, whatever it is. Maximize those 45 minutes. Don't let one minute get away because ultimately do your habits of today align with your goals of tomorrow. You missed one minute. You missed one opportunity to get better that day. Show up. Do the work. Brilliant. And Ted, you you talked about um, you're a Christian. Um, you talked about how the scripture is important to you as part of your sort of morning routine. Can you talk to me about how how that sort of served you? And I'm sure uh, we could probably speak for an hour on that. But but talk to me about what being a Christian means to you. Yeah, man. I mean, that's that's the most important thing because when you live your foundation, my core values, I have personal core values, and they're really tied up into Christianity. It's faith, love, empathy, and consistency. So for me, it's starting out. Am I? Did I do something? When I make a decision, I have to look at it from those four components. So did I make the appropriate decision? If I'm sitting here right now as a Christian, did I do what's appropriate and in alignment with me identifying as a Christian? So if I say yes to that, then it was probably a good decision. If I have a question mark there and I'm like, ah, that's probably not the best decision, then it's probably not the right thing to do. So if I can look at those things with those four core values and those components, it, it ultimately leads me to success, James, because, I mean, when you look at the Christian values, and obviously I, I am a Christian, I identify it, the forgiveness that it entails, the empathy that it entails, how much better would our entire world be off if we all showed a little bit more empathy, if we all showed a little bit more love and, you know, maybe appreciation for everyone else? I think that's ultimately what has probably led me to hopefully continue on some some success. It's being able to deal with people from an empathetic viewpoint because it's hard. Some people do make mistakes, James, and being able to accept that, move on, and then continue to demonstrate your love and pour into those people, that's ultimately going to help you. And all that's founded for me personally on my Christian values. Incredible. And then in terms of like in the context, I guess, of your career now, what's what's most important to you over the next three to five years? Yeah, tough question, but you know, it comes back to this. I want to win championships. And once again, James, if I can show up, do the work daily and have consistent habits in place, that will take care of itself. But if I fast forwarded and took a snapshot three to five years, I want multiple championships. I've always said this to my children. I want to get three Super Bowl rings for each of my children so I can pass one down. And our oldest at the time said, what about mom? I said, kid, four is hard to do. I said, but I love it. You're pushing me to get better. I love that. I'm willing to do it. And right now I have two second place rings. We we get a ring, the NFC and AFC championship teams get a ring as well. I'm like, no, I still need, I still need the real one. I need the world championship one. So that's what's motivating me right now, James. And obviously I've seen what a Super Bowl run can do for people. It's life-changing to some people. And you look at the contracts that our players can get and the success and in, in the recognition, the notoriety, the fame that they can get, and then they can change people's lives and they can do good in this world. That's motive. That's motivating enough. If you can have a positive impact on this world just by doing what you do at a really, really high level, then you have no excuse not to show up and do the work. And I think I'm, I sort of know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask you anyway. But what's your advice to someone listening to this now who's perhaps in a bit of a rut 
maybe doubting themselves a little bit, but perhaps deep down does know they are way more capable than what they're demonstrating. I'd say first, you're not alone. Everyone has it. You know, uh, imposter syndrome is real. There's got, I, I deal with it. We all deal with it. Every person that I've ever met, ever come across, whether you're Jalen Hurts or whether you're a guy that just got cut last week, has dealt with it at some point. So for me, it's come to that realization, look inward and give yourself some empathy and just say, hey, it's all right. I'm having a bad day. The most important thing to do, don't let bad days transcend into the next day. Don't let that opponent beat you today and tomorrow. Put that in the rearview mirror, then take the rearview mirror, throw it out the window and look through the front glass. So for me, don't let bad days multiply. Don't let bad thoughts multiply. If you can move past that right now, move past it. And then when you do fail, when you do have a bad day, give yourself some empathy, give yourself, be forgiveful to yourself and realize you're not alone. Everyone deals with these things. So for me, just make sure you're putting in the work, admit when you have a mistake, admit when you're having a bad day and try to move past it and don't let it continue to multiply. Brilliant. A quick question on elite sport in general. Obviously, you spend 99.9% of your time in the NFL. But in terms of what, what sport's doing well in in terms of human performance, what what do you think the future is going to look like with with the you know the tech, the data, AI? How, how do you think that's going to change the, the elite sport? Man. It's going to continue to change. I know that where we are right now, I do think AI is going to come into play because you look at the data interpretation. There's so much data, like we talked about earlier. AI will definitely be a, be a factor. Cameras, I think where you look at high speed motion analysis, biomechanical analysis, where we are right now compared to 10 years ago is already light years ahead. I do believe that's going to continue to grow and not just in a quote unquote clinical setting where we set up maybe our sports science area and we, we record movement screening or whatever. I think at some point the whole field, it's going to expand to that. And you're already seeing some cool things. Baseball is doing a lot of re really cool things biomechanically, just from camera systems. It's going to continue to grow, but I do think AI is probably coming down the line, James, if I had to predict. And I do think some of the camera technologies and everything else there force plate will continue to expand because that's been something that's given us a ton of valuable information and then how we continue to interpret really moving things from velocity based training and, and things like that. There's going to continue to be better technology every single year. Absolutely. And what do you think the biggest challenge is going to be to teams like the Eagles over the next few years? That's a big part of it. As you can imagine, James, because as we get, you get inundated with so much new technology. And obviously there's so many good ones out there. We have to do our due diligence and vet the appropriate ones. So as we get contacted and people reach out and we get exposure to some of these new technologies, it's investing the time. With that, you have to invest man hours. So it's taking time for employees or it's myself doing a vetting process at a higher level. We have to make sure that we're maintaining efficiency with our time. Time management in our world right now is probably the most important factor. And it's no different for an NFL organization. It's no different for us. As we go into that, we have to make sure we're managing our time and we're still devoting resources into talent acquisition, training our team, building our culture, developing it. You have a lot of things. We have way more now to deal with than we did 10, 15 years ago. So as we do that, we have to make sure, I think one of our biggest challenges will be time management, making sure we're staying in alignment with how we need to put in the appropriate focus and areas. I want to I wanna move on to some more, so I guess quick fire-ish type questions, but I'm really intrigued to, to get the answer to these ones from you. Um, greatest team of all time. Oh, man. I'm going to go back. I would say, I mean, the All Blacks come to mind. There's so many teams that come to mind. The Boston Celtics with Bill Russell, pick a team. He ended up becoming a player coach. If you don't know who Bill Russell is, just read the history of that guy. He's one of the greatest athletes. He's one of I the think there's a Netflix players. documentary that's just come out yes. actually on. Yeah. So I, I would have to pick one of those teams because it's incredible what they were able to accomplish. Yeah. Greatest athlete of all time. To me personally, I think Tiger Woods is in that that conversation because you look at what he did. He had sustainability. Obviously, he's he's elderly now or aging, I should say. I would say he's in there. MJ comes to mind, Michael Jordan, what he was able to do. Man, that's a tough one. I'm thinking tough Wayne one. Gretzky, I'm thinking. <laughs> I don't yeah, know if I can yeah. pick one. Hopefully, it's Jalen Hurts. Not Jalen Hurts. Yeah, let's, uh, I'll ask. Well, well, ten years from now, we'll get on do this again, and <laughs> let's see. Uh, I've got no doubt he's going to be. He's in. He's in for it. 
Um, greatest leader? I'd, if it's sports related, I'd put Bill Russell in there, no doubt. Yeah. Cool. And then, Ted, just just a, a few quick fire ones for you personally. Uh, favorite movie? Favorite movie? I'd say Any Given Sunday. I like Any Given Sunday. What a film. <laughs> what a film. Favorite series? Favorite series. We loved, loved uh, Game of Thrones. It's got to be Game of Thrones. Yeah, incredible. Have you got a favorite book? Extreme Ownership, if I had to hit a quick fire one, because it's that's the book Sean and I were reading when we took the job in LA. Right, okay. We, yep. Great book. Yeah. Is there a quote that stands out or a personal mantra for you that? Yeah. Do your habits of today align with your goals of tomorrow? I mean, I could go through a thousand different quotes, but that's the one that resonates with me every single day. That's what I got to continually ask myself. Brilliant. And, and a final question for me is, if there was one message you can drill into everyone listening to this, what would what would that message be? Consistency is the truest measurement of performance. If you can do anything with consistency, you have an opportunity to be great, to be elite, to do whatever you're doing at the highest level possible. But if you can't do it consistently, you're probably going to fail or you're at least not going to maximize whatever your benefits could have been. So for me, consistency is the truest measurement of performance. Brilliant. Ted, thank you so much for taking the time to, to jump on the podcast. That's been an absolute pleasure. James, thank you. I really appreciate your time. Thanks for the opportunity. What a chat with Ted there. I mean, I just love the intensity and passion he has for the game and his profession. He's someone who, from my perspective, is so clearly concordant with his role. He's leveraging his strengths in an era he's sincerely interested in and for an organization who clearly value the things that are important to him. What also jumped out at me was the reminder that it's a jungle out there and how ruthless elite performance can be at the top in terms of some of the challenges he's faced throughout his career. Another thing I love about Ted is that whole rip it out the rear view mirror and move on, fail or learn attitude that he and the Eagles bring. But I want to draw your focus to Ted's favorite quote or rather question. And that was, are your habits of today consistent with your goals of tomorrow? I think that's such a profound question to ask. And that's what I want us to zero in on now. We touched about it briefly in the conversation, but ultimately when you break it down, tournaments, seasons, careers, they're all really just a series of days that repeat. And to excel, you must win each day, one after the other. And over time, it's these winning days that compound into winning months, winning years, and winning careers. And if you master the day, the years will tend to take care of themselves. And this is where these habits Ted was talking about come in. Now, when I'm talking to you about habits, I'm doing so at both the personal level, but also at the organizational level. Every organization has habits, some good, some not so good. So leaders, owners, managers, keep that in mind as we go through this next stage. Now, my favorite quote that everyone who works with me is most likely sick to death of is, excellence is not about doing extraordinary things. It's about doing ordinary things extraordinarily well. The reality is outlier performers and organizations do ordinary things, but they do them without thinking consistently well and for a long time, which is what enables their progress to compound and hit tipping points. It's what gets them to the top and keeps them there. Sustaining all it takes to excel can feel overwhelming. That tends to be because we think that executing all these habits is a case of sheer discipline. If you miss a training session, procrastinate or sleep in is because you lack willpower or you're mentally weak. You can choose to overpower temptation through forcing discipline, but in the long term, it's a terrible losing strategy. I would not recommend. Yes, discipline is important. No one with a right mind would argue otherwise, but outliers like Ted or a Jalen Hurts who might appear to have this sickening level of discipline are ironically the ones who need it the least. These guys have an internal compulsion to act on the right things at the right times, and it strikes them without thinking. They've structured their lives in ways that do not require Herculean willpower to help them win their days. They form great habits. 
Again, the focus is on working smarter, not harder. And there is nothing that consolidates your development trajectory like a set of functional habits. They're like algorithms operating in the background that power your life. When you're executing habits, everything's automatic and effortless, which means they sustain you whether you're inspired, motivated, determined or not. To optimize your habits, you need to understand how they work. And that's what we're going to talk about now. So habits arise in a three-step cycle. The basic process is that we experience a cue uh, trigger that sparks a set of automatic reactions. This could include feeling bored. The cue in this case is a feeling, an emotion. Then we enact a routine, a specific series of actions you undertake when the cue is triggered, which then gives you a reward. The quality of that reward will dictate how powerful your desire to act will be. In this case, the reward might be to escape from boredom or feel content, basically an emotional payoff. When you repeat this behavior, the reward will eventually create a craving. And cravings are the motivational force behind every habit. They're driven by the pleasure or motivation hormone dopamine, which is way, way, way more powerful than your discipline, motivation and resilience combined. The more you repeat the habit, the earlier the dopamine is released. And eventually, just thinking about executing a habit will make you feel good, which is great if you've got good habits. Not so great if the habit is suboptimal in terms of your performance. And we're going to talk about how to optimize there. The beauty here is that you can manipulate this three-step habit cycle in a way that enables you to optimize your habits and win your day. Through designing, building, and reshaping each component part to help eliminate the negative habits, but also to fortify the positive habits. And that's what I'm going to show you how to do now. So let's start at the beginning with cues. Now, the first thing that dictates any behavior are the cues in front of you. So through keeping the cues for desirable behavior front and center, you can trigger the cravings that compel you to take the right types of action. And if you can make the negative cues invisible, very often the entire negative habit disintegrates altogether. This is really about becoming the architect of your environment, filling it with the productive cues and eliminating the negative ones. So in terms of building positive habits and manipulating cues, you must plant the cues that trigger the behaviors that win your days. If you wanna practice the guitar, then don't tuck it away in the closet. If you wanna drink more water, Keep filled water bottles stored in locations you're going to find yourself in throughout the day. When it comes to eliminating negative habits, if there's no cue, there's no craving. The cue is what creates the craving behind every habit. So without the craving, you avoid that anticipatory dopamine squirt and there's no desire to engage in that bad habit. So removing things from plain sight is one way to do this. If you're interrupted by calls, emails, texts, leave your phone in another room. If you're wasting too much time on Netflix, move the television out of the bedroom. If you're playing too much FIFA, Fortnite, or whatever it might be, unplug the console and store it out of sight. And if you're feeling insecure, stop following social media accounts that trigger those feelings of inferiority. The next area we can manipulate is the routine part of the habit. Every action requires a certain amount of energy. And the more energy required, the less likely that behavior is to occur. We call this the path of least resistance. So the key here is to reduce the effort required to enact your good habits and to increase the effort associated with your bad ones. So in terms of building positive habits, when you decide to get into shape, you might feel you have to do everything at once. You join the gym, you buy your new running kit, you cut out all the junk food, set the alarm for 5.30 a.m., you're mentally prepared for a David Goggins inspired all out assault and fitness. You're motivated, excited, full of willpower to get started. But after a week, maybe a month, the motivation's lost, the excitement's gone, and you've got nothing left to give. Why? Because you've made fitness a short term, inconvenient nightmare instead of making it a long term, sustainable part of your winning day. And here is the critical point. If you want to make a habit stick, you need to make it easy to do. A new habit should not feel like a massive challenge. Instead, it's like a seed you plant that will grow across time. 
Meditate for one minute instead of 20. Sit and read one page of a novel instead of three chapters. Performing the habit is way more important than doing the perfect amount required for you to excel. And by starting out small, you're less likely to say no. This way, you'll do it, even when you don't feel like it. And this is how you create habits that last and habits that most importantly will grow. A great hack here is to use something called habit stacking. Here, what you do is use your existing habits to build in new ones through adding them to the existing routine. So for example, I get up, I pour my morning of coffee each morning. I stretch for one minute. After stretching for a minute, I close my eyes and visualize executing my winning day. Then on the flip side, with routines and eliminating negative habits, remember, if you want to do something less, you need to make it hard. If a routine requires more effort than you're willing to expend, then guess what? You just won't do it. Any behavior that's easy to get addicted to, think scrolling through social media, watching television, ordering junk food, they can be performed with close to zero effort. Unplug the television, take the batteries out of the remote after each use, store unhealthy food in the garage if you have to have it in the house at all. This forces you to exert inconvenient effort to execute that habit. Deleting social media apps on your phone so you're forced to log in through a web browser each time. Removing your credit card information from e-commerce sites so you can't buy without thinking twice. Setting your alarm and leaving it at the end of your bed so you're forced to get up when it goes off are all examples of how you can make your bad habits a lot harder to execute, which dramatically reduces the probability you're going to engage in them in the first place, which is our aim. You can even make it impossible to execute. Make a decision in the present, here and now, that controls your actions in the future. For example, you can use apps to block out work email from Friday evening through to a Monday morning. You could book a two-week green zone retreat a year in advance if taking time out is a habit you really need to establish. You can even program automatic timers to cut off the power at the Wi-Fi router at, say, 8 o'clock. And there's tons of great apps like Off Time, Break Free, or Flip D that analyze the use of your smartphone and allow you to set custom lockouts to specific apps whether that's social media, email, or games even. The final component of the habit cycle we can manipulate is the reward piece. Whenever you perceive that something will be rewarding, your levels of dopamine spike in anticipation. And whenever dopamine rises, so does your motivation to act. If you increase the reward, you increase the motivation. If you reduce the reward, you reduce the motivation. There are about three ways you can use rewards to build positive habits. Now, the first, establish a very clear, explicit reward by linking the activities you already do, like uh, relaxing or watching Netflix, with those you want to establish, like exercising or meditating or going to bed early. You can create a motivation to act by doing so. You can meditate in a perfectly drawn bath, or you can exercise while you're listening to your favorite audiobook or even watching Netflix. Second, habit tracking. Progress is the ultimate motivation. And this is what's great about habit tracking. All you need is a calendar and a pen. And every day you execute your routine, you can mark that calendar with a big green tick. And this builds a visual cue that you've executed your habit, providing you with a sign that you're moving forward. Marking the tick becomes a reward itself across time. It gives you this satisfying visual proof of your hard work and a subtle reminder of how far you've come. And this has been proven to increase adherence with habits from anywhere between 20 right up to 80%. So definitely worth a go. The amount of people I meet that actually say, oh, you know, yeah, 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 I absolutely do that all the time. Yeah, yeah. And I can tell by just looking at them that they're talking absolute nonsense. And this is such a key point. Most of us are actually delusional when it comes to our own behavior. And habit tracking is just a great way to keep this delusion in track. So I highly, highly recommend giving it a go. A third option is to optimize your social circle. It's so easy to put the extra hours in. If everyone else does, it's easier to get the sleep uh, an hour earlier. If everyone else does, it's easier to be active. If everyone else is, spending time with people who have established the habits that you seek increases the probability of you sticking to the challenge. And not only that, it's a great source of information, encouragement, praise, and fun. 
When it comes to eliminating bad habits and leveraging resources, the first thing you need to do is figure out what the reward is. And this can be confusing at times. It's not always obvious, but there is always a purpose or goal in there somewhere, even if objectively the habit appears to be a really, really dumb one. You need to switch your thinking from why did I do that to what did I get out of that? The reward you crave is not the habit itself, but the change in state it delivers. So when you binge eat, drink too much or browse social media, what you really want to do is feel different. The question then becomes, are there more functional ways to feel different? So here we're working with the same cues and rewards, but we're adapting the routine. If you're craving sugar, for example, it's not necessarily chocolate you need. It could be an orange, kiwi fruit, or apple. And believe it or not, there's actually a decent chance that the sugar in the fruit will actually satisfy the craving. And by substituting a new routine, so the orange for the chocolate, you can, in effect, optimize the habit. And when it comes to unhealthy snacking, the classic go-to when talking about habits, the question is whether the reward we're seeking is to satisfy our hunger or overcome boredom. Most of the time, snacking is a symptom of boredom and can be substituted with another routine. This can range from engaging your mind in some kind of game, be it bored, electronic, or physical, stimulating conversation, again, digital or in person, or simply eating something less unhealthy. It doesn't have to be perfect. Again, we need to remember better is better. Another reason that so many of us struggle with habits in terms of rewards is what we call secondary gain. So these are the rewards you receive from your problems. In psychology, we use the term secondary gain to describe the rewards you receive from your problems. And many of us fail to break bad habits because those bad habits actually provide us with rewards we aren't quite conscious of. Take stress as an example. I think it's a great one here. It can be a highly, highly rewarding habit for some. By sticking with stress, you don't have to exert any effort. You go on receiving sympathy from family, friends, loved ones, which is a very real and rewarding benefit for some people. Plus, getting rid of stress would come at a very high price. You'd have to take responsibility for doing something about it. Uh, you'd have to admit you do it to yourself. You'd have to stop blaming others. You'd also have to learn new skills, acquire knowledge, practice to reinforce all of that. It's a very real and demanding task. And, and that's why most just don't bother. The good news is that once you've identified the secondary gain, you have the option to structure more functional ways to achieve those same rewards. You could ask loved ones to stop giving you sympathy. You could find healthy ways to relax. You could acquire just one of two very maybe simple skills that might combat the stress we're talking about. And as a consequence, you start to weaken and eventually break down the habit. And again, it's about planting seeds, not taking the sledgehammer to the habit. Now, in terms of genuinely conquering your habits, there's a few other options you have that can be highly effective. And the first one is good old fashioned thinking ahead. So aside from manipulating the habit cycle itself, thinking ahead has been proven to be extremely effective. Written plans can actually double the rate at which you acquire new habits, specifically writing about where you perceive temptation to be strongest, when it's likely to occur, and what strategy you could use to overcome it. This increases the probability of staying on track. The process primes your mind to exhibit the, the adaptive response if and when the challenge does arrive. This will be a key feature in the Mindset app that's launching early next year. So the questions you need to answer in this case are, first up, why is the habit beneficial to you? What is the cue? What is the routine? What's the reward? How will you avoid any negative cues? How will you respond if you do encounter them? How will you feel if you make the right choices? How will you feel if you make the wrong choices? And finally, what will forming this habit mean for you? A final few tips from me are that when it comes to optimizing your habits so that you can win your days, better beats perfect. It's so, so easy to get bogged down trying to find the perfect plan, the fastest way to lose weight, the best program to build muscle, the perfect idea for a side hustle. And you can end up so focused on figuring out the best approach that you never actually get round to taking action. If you want to master a habit, the key is to start with repetition, not perfection. 
So again, we're looking at planting those seeds that will grow across time. The other potential problem is thinking that if you can't do the whole thing, then you shouldn't do it at all. Now, habits are a process, not an event. You don't have to do it all. If you don't have enough time to do a full workout, just crack 5,000 steps at lunchtime. If you don't have enough time to write an article, write a paragraph. And if you don't have enough time to do yoga, take three deep breaths and touch your toes. Individually, these less than perfect behaviors seem insignificant, but it's the cumulative effect of sticking to the schedule that forms robust habits that stick. Next up, I suggest you try and avoid consecutive errors. So it works a little bit like this. You avoid social media all day, then three o'clock, you can't help yourself, you log in. Or you get up on time a week, and then on Friday, you hit snooze. You follow your eating plan religiously for a week, and then break it up with a Saturday binge. Slip-ups don't make you a failure. They make you a human. Missing one opportunity to perform the behavior doesn't materially affect the habit formation process itself. It's the cumulative impact of never getting back on track that will cause you problems. So your aim should be to never really miss two in a row. Now, through optimizing your habits, you'll win your days and you'll shift the baseline and upward trajectory of your performance, your health and your quality of life for the months, years and your life ahead. Please, please, please leverage this science. It's so powerful and transformational. And keep Ted Rath at the back of your mind. Periodically check in and ask yourself that question. Are your habits of today aligned with your goals of tomorrow? I want to say another massive thank you to Ted. Great conversation, mate, and hopefully see you in Philly soon. Keep up the good work. Thank you for choosing to spend your time with us today. I love this topic of human performance and excellence, and I've been engaged in it neurotically for the last 20 years. It's a sincere privilege to have the opportunity to share my knowledge, network, and learnings with you. Now, go and put the principles to work. Make sure you let us know what resonates. Reach out with questions. Blind spots, we've got you covered. Remember, excellence is just a series of days repeated over and over again. Now go and win your day. In 2021, I published my first book, Accelerating Excellence. If you're finding the conversations and information on this podcast useful, you might want a physical reference point and to gain even deeper awareness of the concepts discussed. The book's actually more of an operation manual containing more detail with a step-by-step -step guide on how to implement all this stuff so you can get maximum benefit, which was one of my main motivations in writing it. Yes, I want the podcast and the book to be inspiring and entertaining, but it was non-negotiable for me to make sure that the listener or reader is provided with a structure and direction in terms of actually putting this stuff to work. The book's called Accelerating Excellence. It's a number one international bestseller. And if you're moving from more than just interest towards implementation, I think you'll really enjoy it. Like everything I do, the book is evidence-based, but practice-led, drawing on my experience, working with some of the world's most elite, exclusive, high-performing teams and individuals. It's filled with highly actionable strategies you can apply today to become better tomorrow. If this sounds like something from you, see the link in description where you can download six chapters of the book for free in either audio or digital format. It's also available to purchase on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and at your local bookstore. I hope you enjoy. By now, we all know the importance of a winning mindset. We're bombarded with elite performers telling us that mindset's what separates the best from the rest. That if we want to be successful, we need to be more confident, resilient, and motivated. And of course, when panic strikes, we need to calm down, relax, or chill out. Great, we get it. But the question is how? We're given this guidance with almost zero practical advice in terms of how to achieve it. Where can we actually go to develop that world-class mindset? What's the back squat for resilience, the bench press for confidence, and the bicep curl for positive thinking? Well, that's why I created the Mindset app. Through the app, you'll gain access to the psychological skills training used by world champion athletes, special forces operators, and some of the world's most successful traders and investors. The reality is these guys pay me a fortune to help them get this right. But the thing is, these skills are equally, if not more important, for the aspiring athlete, executive, or operator. And that's exactly why I created this app. I want these tools and training available to anyone, anywhere, anytime.
Mindset is a skill and like any skill, it can be developed with the right strategy and effort. The tools and techniques are designed in a way that will literally rewire your brain. Like learning to ride a bike or drive a car, all the techniques are designed with creating a high-performing, self-regulating U2.0. Every strategy in the Mindset app is backed by empirical research. There's 10-minute emotional control training exercises that have been shown to increase your ability to overcome detrimental decision-making biases by up to 80%. In another study, just three weeks of executing visualization training led to 34% improvements in performance. Another research group found 50% greater improvements in the rate of learning. And just a few weeks of performing visualization led to 22% reductions in anxiety and 21% increases in confidence. These numbers are phenomenal. And I've never met an elite performer in any domain that can afford to be missing out on this type of edge. What I love most is that we've structured everything so that you don't need to carve out an extra hour in your day to get this done. Small bite-sized chunks of five to 10 minutes are all it takes. In fact, I'd only encourage you to use the tool on your commute, in the sauna, at the end of your working day, or bolt it onto the end of your gym session. Any dead time you have can now immediately be transformed to deliver you extreme performance gains. My goal is to remove every possible obstacle to your development. And with that in mind, the basic package is completely free. Visit the link in description and sign up for our pre-launch free emotional control, visualization, and performance routine programs. I really hope you enjoy.